Hi, this is a conversation with Dr. Jerry L. Jordan, who is a former economic advisor to President Ronald Reagan. And uh, Dr. Jordan, uh, this, is, this year the centennial of the Federal Reserve is being celebrated. In which context? Well, it's a multi-year program. It started earlier this year because the Federal Reserve was created by Congress uh, in 1913, but right at the end of the year. So it didn't start to operate until 1914. So through the next year, 2014, we'll be spending a lot of time looking back over the 100 years. What's been the experience? What, what have we learned? Um, was it a good idea? Uh, maybe it was a big mistake. Uh, but also, uh, more importantly, looking forward, is the next hundred years going to be more of the same? Can we improve? Can we make changes so that we look back after these, this 21st century and say they did a better job or some other arrangements did a better job than the last hundred years? Can you share with us what has been learned about this experience? A lot of mistakes. Uh, there's only been a couple of short periods where people would generally say the Federal Reserve did a very good job during the great moderation from uh, around uh, 1990 up until the middle of the last decade. Uh, they did quite good. Low inflation, low unemployment, good productivity, good growth. Uh, uh, it was a tranquil, a tranquil period. Um, but mo for the most part, it was a period of either high inflation, like the 1960s and 70s, high interest rates uh, like the 1980s, uh, or big depression like the Great uh, Depression of the 1930s. And so over the course of the 100 years, if you look at decade by decade, it's a very mixed uh, uh, record that a lot of people would criticize is they could have done better. There are people who say, maybe if we'd have just stayed on the gold standard and never created a central bank, maybe things would have been better. There are people today that would like to go back to a gold standard, uh, but the United States can't do that alone. Uh, and it's not likely that we're gonna have an international agreement with the major countries around the world, a gold standard. So it's a time where we're going to um, try and think way, our way through, maybe there's something better um, that can be done in nations. Um, it, uh, no one wants to defend the current system is the best we can do. Uh, before going to options, since you mentioned that maybe there is something better. Uh, let's, let's talk about um, the negative results of the Federal Reserve are structural in the sense of because of the organization it, itself or the institution itself, or it's because of how is it that it has been managed? Well, I think it's a good, a good place to start is at the time the Federal Reserve was created, the United States was on a gold standard as most of the world was. The British, all the Europeans, uh, almost everyone in the world, their currency was defined in terms of gold or maybe silver or maybe both. So when the Federal Reserve banks were created, the idea was it was to be clearinghouse associations owned by the government, sort of, but spread across the country to serve commercial banks. They referred to them as bankers' banks. But there was no idea that we would have monetary policy uh, because we were on the gold standard. Uh, so we didn't have the, the abilities that they have today. But as soon as the Federal Reserve was created and up and operational in 1914, World War I started. And a couple of years later, the United States entered uh, the war uh, and the world went off the gold standard because most of the countries around the world, as always in wars, they needed to print money uh, and uh, in order to finance the wars. And the United States experienced very high inflation, not as high as uh, France or uh, England or some of the other countries, but very high inflation. And so the war ended and they decided, well, we have to do something about the inflation. And the U.S. suffered a very sharp recession, maybe a 20% decline in real output in one year. But it was very short and they recovered and then the economy uh, enjoyed what has been known, known as the Roaring Twenties. It seemed to be going very well. Uh, but they really didn't understand the powers of the institution, and so we had the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, the, there was more legislation to create the Federal Open Market Committee, a, a committee of the governors in Washington and the presidents of the reserve banks, 19 people. And that's really the monetary policy authorities of the U.S., not the Federal Reserve Banks, not the Board of Governors, 
with this um, strange kind of a committee that is a government agency, but it has, it's a virtual agency. Young people today would understand it in the, in the virtual sense because it has no buildings, no staff, no budget, yet it exists um, in order to conduct monetary policy. And that, I think, is, is a troubling kind of concept because even members of, the, of our Congress that oversee the Federal Reserve don't really understand how it operates. Uh, yet they're charged, first by the Constitution and then by legislation, to oversee the monetary authorities. But they get confused about the nature of it. The Reserve Banks, I think, are very well managed in what they do of payments services. Uh, trillions of dollars of payments every night get paid and nobody has any questions about it. They do a, a, a remarkable job. The Board of Governors in Washington is basically a supervisory agency. They've had a mixed record recently with all the bank failures and the uh, problems of the great financial crisis of the last five years. But it's this open market committee of, uh, uh, that does monetary policy where there's the greatest um, discomfort about how well they're doing and whether we could change that and, and do something different, do something that would um, maybe provide more stability, low inflation, low unemployment, good growth for the next hundred years. You, you mentioned options vis-a-vis -vis the concept of Federal Reserve and Central Bank. Can, can we talk about these options? Yeah, it's an interesting idea that is only uh, starting to be discussed in the U.S. Guatemala already has had the experience of allowing foreign currencies to be used. In fact, Guatemala is one of the very few countries in the whole world that allows legal use of a foreign currency alongside uh, the, the national currency. And that's an idea that I think needs to be uh, given more attention. In Europe, uh, at the end of the 1990s, about 15 years ago, they started on a road to create a pan-European currency, the euro. But as a part of that, uh, I was opposed to the euro. I was a, uh, a skeptic of the euro because they made the euro a new monopoly currency and abolished the Deutsche Mark, the French franc, uh, the Italian lira, the Spanish peseta. And I think that was a mistake. I think it would have been better if the countries in Europe had said, okay, our country in Germany is the Deutsche Mark, in Spain is the peseta, but we will allow people to use another currency, the British pound, the American dollar, in contracts, in commercial transactions, and retail transactions at, at the supermarket. Uh, they didn't do that. Uh, that currency competition, I think, had the potential of, of greater stability. And I'm hopeful that the discussion in the United States will now go towards currency competition, which would mean end the monopoly of the U.S. dollar, allow people to use Canadian dollars or Mexican pesos or British pounds or Swiss francs in their contracts, and the courts will enforce that, even the payment of taxes. But that's going to be a long process to convince people to give up legal tender laws, as uh, some countries like uh, Guatemala that allow currency competition have effectively done, and the payment of taxes. Uh, the hard part will be the legal system that if we were to have contracts in payment of, uh, say, uh, Swiss francs in the United States and there's non-performance, a breach of contract, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work, then the courts would have to enforce the contract in, in its, the terms of the parties that made the contract. If I'm owed Swiss francs, then I get Swiss francs. That doesn't happen now. The courts will give me a, an equivalent amount of U.S. dollars, even if I was promised gold or silver. And the only way we're going to be able to move towards uh, maybe possibly gold back or silver back currencies uh, or an international currency would be the courts have to be willing to enforce contracts in the terms that the parties agreed to. So it's a big educational effort to try to get people and especially Congress to understand and to be comfortable with those ideas. Wh wh why is it that people cling to national currencies? In, that's an interesting question because if you go back 20 or 30 years or so, we had national everything, national airlines. Guatemala had a national airline. Every country and small countries in Africa, Asia, all over Latin America, they had their own airlines, <coughs> their own banks, uh, their own phone companies, their own flag, of course, uh, and their own currency. All of these things uh, through the 20th century were a part of what it meant to be a nation. 
uh, after the breakup of the empires after World War II, uh, the British colonies, the French, the Belgian, the German colonies in Africa and, and Asia and those places, first things they wanted to do, uh, besides having a national anthem and a flag, they wanted to have their own currency, and then they would say, well, we also need our own airline and we're our own this and that. And I think for young people today, the idea of national origin or local con content must seem like a strange idea because they grew up used to buying uh, running shoes that were made they don't even know where and actually don't care, airlines that were uh, uh, international airlines serving their country, banks, uh, even the, the hamburgers and pizzas may come from uh, companies that are not national. And it, so it's only been very recently that we could open up this idea, well, you don't even need a national currency. Just use the currency that, that does the best job of reflecting relative price changes. Guatemala had its own uh, merchant fleet with no ships. <laughs> a merchant fleet with no ships, no is, ships. A, is an interesting yes. concept. <laughs> that would be more difficult for a country like Bolivia that also has no ocean, but I think they did have a navy in Bolivia. They do. Yeah, they do. But no oceans. <laughs> right. Um, can we change subject? Certainly. I, I, yeah. I know that you're interested in history, yeah. especially in British history, nearby the times of the Carta Magna, Magna Carta. Uh, can you tell us about, about this and, and why? Well, I've been reading and, uh, and listening to audios of uh, sometimes fiction, sometimes history, about how do the ideas that were uh, benefiting from today, how did they come to be? And it's uh, certainly the British uh, common law, Ma Magna Carta, and the evolution of ideas there, but also Salamanca, Spain, and how the uh, Enlightenment era of this, uh, the philosophers from that period uh, created the foundation of ideas that we're all benefiting from. One of the things I've enjoyed over the last couple of years is uh, fiction by Ken Follett, uh, a writer who, a British writer, Pillars of, the first was Pillars of the Earth, starts right around the time of the Magna Carta, and they discover uh, specialization, comparative advantage, trade, even the use of money. Most of the people, the peasants, the poor people, uh, had no concept of money or wages, and yet they would engage in barter and trade uh, across uh, the channel with uh, the French, the Spanish, uh, uh, all down into Italy, and only gradually learned that the um, wool that they were growing in England, instead of selling it to the Italian merchants, really for trade, it basically barter for something, that they could get metal coins, money, and use those coins to buy something that they wanted from France or from Belgium or Spain. And so it was, it's an evolutionary process of learning about uh, money, but also laws, uh, courts, uh, wages. Uh, one, in the sequel to Pillars of the Earth, World Without End, uh, we find um, the uh, priors, and the priests of the uh, church, the monks, uh, the monks often want to find new ways to tax people in order to support the cathedral, the priory, and they're always looking at, for talking about, well, could, if we tax the people this way, how much money can we raise? Meanwhile, the people are saying, well, the priory wants to tax us that way. What can we do to avoid the tax or to minimize the amount of tax that we get? And it, it distorts trade. Uh, if the, merchant, if the uh, merchants and, and the uh, uh, tradespeople become proficient at doing one thing and starting to get rich doing that, well, immediately the, the priory will say, well, oh, there's, there's money being made over there, now let's tax them. So it's, in that sense, nothing has really changed. Uh, the same today, governments want to create new ways to tax people, and people want to find new ways to avoid paying the taxes that the, that the government is imposing. Uh, an interesting development around the time of uh, King Edward III in England, well, this was in the 1350s or so, was that the um, people uh, and after the Black Death, especially in the decline of the population and the, the lack of workers to till the fields, wanted to pay more wages in order, and they would compete, and they would go send someone to a neighboring region of the country and offer them, well, if you come over and till the fields in our area, then we'll pay you higher wages. 
And of course, the people in the other areas, the lords, the bishops, didn't like that. So they went to the king and the parliament and said, we want to pass a maximum wage law, and did. And today, when much of the world is talking about minimum wage laws, the United States has one for the whole country and various states, various cities, counties, have their own minimum wage law, and the idea of the fair wage is the most, is uh, the, uh, the minimum amount businesses can pay to workers. In England, in that period of time, they were setting maximum wages, and so the workers couldn't compete, or businesses that wanted to hire workers, or landlords that wanted to hire workers to till the fields, uh, to look after their, their animals or crops, were not allowed to offer higher wages or they were gonna to go to jail. It's a very strange idea. And all these phenomena on um, uh, money, trade, uh, laws happened without central banks and no internet. Yes, yeah, so there was no internet for sure. And as far as central banks, uh, because most of the world was on a commodity standard, gold or silver, uh, there really wasn't an idea of creating what we have today as fiat money. Uh, Guatemala's had the history of coins that have been denominated in units of corn or sugar cane or various commodities. So the world was discovering what is money, what gives money its value, and so a trader would go into a new area to uh, offer to, to bring the coins from where he came from and offered these coins for something he wanted to purchase, but the people would look at this coin and wonder what it is, uh, how much its value is, what can they do to, for it. So it, it evolved into it had to have a certain weight of gold or silver and a certain degree of pureness to be trusted if you were bringing coins from uh, Italy to go to a rural part of England um, they wanted to be sure it was something of value that they in turn could trade to something else. So it was a discovery process over many decades, even centuries, about the nature of money. Uh, fiat money, printed uh, by governments and central banks, is only 100 years old. Uh, that idea uh, didn't exist in the 19th century. Uh, they, they were aware intellectually of the potential of paper money, but no one trusted the idea because they were afraid that the governments might print too much of it, which of course is what happened. And so I think after a hundred years of central banks and paper money, I think it's time that we rethink, is that really the best we can do? Now people are talking about digital money, bitcoins, or things that are created on the computer that uh, don't have a paper component, don't have a metal component. It's just digits uh, on the hard drive. What's your idea on bitcoins? Bitcoins particularly is uh, an innovation, but it's not yet money or a currency. But I think that kind of thing is a part of the, our future, that people will c become accustomed to, instead of having paper in their wallet or coins in their pocket, they will have a balance that may be recorded on their cell phone. Uh, and they will be able to transfer that balance to somebody else. There's some projects already around the world. In Kenya, Africa, they have a, a a currency called an M-Pesa. And a Spanish phone company, Telefonica, is one of the participants in this. And so Telefonica, as a phone company, has become sort of a bank. And that when people are paid for their, their wages, for their work, a, a balance is recorded on their cell phone. And they want to transfer that balance back to the village, maybe where they came from, and they go through their phone and they transfer it to a, a phone of their family or a friend or somebody else in a village far away from them. I think that there's gonna be a lot more experimentation with that idea and young people growing up with the idea that money is a balance on a cell phone or uh, uh, an iPad uh, will just be automatic and natural to them. And in time, that'll be money. Finally, if, uh, if a central banker approaches you and asks for a piece of advice in 45 seconds. <laughs> what would that piece of advice be? To any politician or policymaker, the great contest of the last, 20, the last 200 years is how to limit government spending to the amount of tax revenue that can reasonably be raised. Under a, a gold or silver standard, commodity money, governments could not get themselves massively into debt and the potential of bankrupting the people. Governments could not promise pensioners, retirements, 
way beyond what tax systems could generate and again possibly bankrupt the countries. So when the U.S. Constitution was founded, the, the primary author, James Madison, wrote about, well, this is a challenge for us to how to, eliminate, uh, uh, how to limit the amount of money that politicians spend or promise to spend because politicians will always want to say yes to the voters and the gold standard forced them to say no. And now 230 years later, from the time the U.S. Constitution uh, was, was written, we're still trying to find a way to, to give politicians a reason to say no to the voters. We don't have the money, sorry, I would really like to give you more money, but we don't have any more money. With central banks and printing money, there's always the temptation to simply say yes to everyone. So public spending is not a source of prosperity? No, public spending has become the greatest threat to preserving prosperity and maybe even our liberties because um, of the ability to always say yes to people. It reduces the incentive for a lot of people to even work if the government is willing to give them money for the things they need, for food, for clothing, for housing, without working. Well, of course, the economy cannot work that way. People need to be responsible for their own well-being and uh, to work for, uh, for what they get. But government's ability to pr print money and to pass it out to people undermines that incentive of the work ethic of a modern economy. Dr. Jordan, thank you for sharing these ideas with us and thank you too.